Raise the flag. Light the cauldron. We, we declare, declare the, the game's, game's Odyssey, Odyssey open. Welcome to the Games Odyssey podcast, your home for stories of glory from Olympia to now. I'm Jonathan Jordan. And I'm Sarah Patton. And today is actually one of our practice episodes. So hopefully this is going to be a lot of fun because we really don't know what we're doing. Um, So if you are listening to this at some point in the future, I hope you have fun laughing at us as we kind of fumble through everything. But... In the course of putting together this podcast and doing a lot of research, um, honestly, it kind of took me down a rabbit hole of thinking about the history of, you know, sports in general. I mean, Sarah, have you ever looked into that for yourself? I have a little bit, but it's been a while. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's one of those things where it's like sports is just kind of a part of our lives. And so we don't really always think about where came from and everyone has their favorites and kind of pursues that. Um, Sarah, remind me, did you do any sports growing up at all? Yeah, whenever I was younger, I did all the sports I could. I tried basketball, t-ball, softball, um, anything that my brother and I could do. We were in all the little rec leagues, soccer. I tried gymnastics, but my main sport that I stuck with through high school was volleyball. Okay, gotcha. What about Um, you? As far as I'm concerned, um, you know, I really like watching sports. I was not (laughs) the greatest at it. Um, Yeah, kind of like you, I I did some of the Little League stuff, a little bit of baseball, a little bit of soccer. Um, Really, the only sport I did seriously was running. Uh, So, you know, I I love track and field events. I discovered in middle school that I was, uh, as much as I wanted to be a sprinter, I was better at long distance. So I did cross country in high school. And, you know, I wish I could say I was coordinated, but I'm really not. I had multiple races where I would fall down. And that's excusable in cross country because we were running up and down hills and things like that. But I also fell down in track on, you know, regular tracks. Um, (laughs) Happens to all of us at some point. (laughs) Yeah. So that gives you an idea of how good I am um, (laughs) at sports. Uh, My, my son is far and above way more gifted in that arena than I am. Um, But yeah, when starting to kind of look into the Olympics a little bit deeper and where did sports come from, it it really did just take me into this rabbit hole that I thought was worth exploring. So so here's some of the kind of big things that I learned, some of the big takeaways. Um, First, sports has been around since prehistory and it developed all over the world. So it's not like one people group or one country can you know, take credit for saying that they invented it. It was happening, you know, thousands of miles apart from each other, which is really cool to think that this kind of idea of of friendly competition uh, is a human trait, not just uh, isolated to a specific culture, right? Um, A lot of today's really popular sports have histories that are over a thousand years old. Uh, That was one of the things that really amazed me about this is just how far back some of these things go. The ancient Olympic Games, which was my starting point, of course, for this topic, uh, that's widely considered by a lot of scholars as the first documented formalized sporting event ever. So that's kind of one of the things to understand going into this is that even though sports has been around for a long time, you have to think of the definition of history. Uh, History are events that have been recorded, and anything that doesn't get recorded that happens uh, is just mystery instead of history, I guess. Uh, So the Olympics, because they were documented, because they were recorded, because they had agreed upon rules, most scholars point to that as kind of the, the birthplace of sporting events as we understand them. Uh, But our even more modern concept of sports clubs, um, competitions, that really started to get formalized in the 19th century. So in the 1800s, that's really where you start to see people saying, hey, 
uh, we should do this for fun and we should agree what the rules are going to be, regardless of what kind of athletic pursuit it was. So, um, so on that note, we're going to take a quick little break and then we're going to jump in the time machine after that and talk about the oldest sports that we know of. You ready? Let's go. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what we know about sports from before history, so prehistory, and also just kind of what was happening around the world uh, throughout different stages of time. So from the research I did, it looks like there's been a documented history of sports for at least 3,000 years. Um, and, you know, we can't really know for sure how it began, but... Most likely, what a lot of scholars seem to agree on is sports probably was an evolution of people preparing for war or training for, you know, hunting, just those kind of basic necessities of life as war and hunting are, I suppose. Um, so you you might think that some of the oldest sports would be things like spear throwing or what we would call javelin, um, you know, throwing rocks around, uh, shot put, uh, sparring, boxing, things of that nature. Um, if, if you had to guess, Sarah, what would you think is the oldest sport? Well, if I had to guess off the top of my head, my impulse would say something to do with running just because hmm. that's seeing, you know, just does a brother look at his brother and say, hey, I can run farther than you? Whenever we think about the history of sports, I assume that sibling rivalry was involved at some point. It's um, a good but, point. So I would guess running, but I don't think that's the correct answer. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you made a really valid point, I think, with, <laughs> with sibling rivalry. Um, I, I have two older brothers. And they're quite a bit older than me. And, you know, when I was younger, they were definitely smarter than me. So uh, they used to play this game. Do you have older siblings at all? I have an older brother. Okay. Um, did did he by chance ever play a game with you called See Who Can Punch the Softest? <laughs> no, because we knew he could punch the hardest. It wasn't yes. a game. We just knew it. <laughs> yeah. My my brothers had this game they played with me called See Who Can Punch the Softest, and they would always let me go first, and so I would do this, like, little tap, and then they would go, <laughs> pop, oh, I lose. Um, I fell for that more times than I'm going to admit right here, uh, right now, but uh, that's what sibling rivalry looked like um, in our house, and another time that my oldest brother pinned me down on the ground uh, while I was helping him move into an apartment, by the way, um, he pinned me down on the ground and said he wouldn't let me up until I licked his armpit. Um, uh -huh. And yeah, meanwhile, my dad was in the corner talking on the phone and I, I was yelling for his help. Dad, dad. And my dad looked over from the phone. He said, hey, can you all quiet it down? I'm talking to your mom right now. And then went right back to his conversation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so again, um yeah, there were, I, I can definitely see a port of, you know, a place for sibling rivalry in this. But yeah, I mean, at some point it was probably one guy looking at another guy and saying, I bet I can throw a rock farther than you or I can get to that wall quicker than you or something like that. So um, so we don't know exactly where it came from, but I think people have always had a need to compete against each other in some form or fashion. But again, getting back to the definition of history and what's actually been documented and written down from the research I did, I found out that um, bowling may actually be the oldest sport uh, in the world. Uh, apparently, there have been wall drawings found in Egypt uh, dating back to 5200 B.C., and Sarah, as you know, you can't have a history conversation without mentioning Egypt. Uh, it, it's a law somewhere. So, so yeah, so in Africa, I mean, that's where Egypt is. You had Egyptians who loved sports and games, and they did a number of different uh, bowling-type activities, at least from what we figured out. But uh, we'll come back to them here in a little bit. Um, meanwhile, over in Asia... 
we can find evidence of early versions of soccer or uh, football, as everyone else in the world calls it, except for us in America. Uh, but it was called Su Chu, and there's uh, evidence that they use this kind of like hide ball to kick around. Again, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a few minutes. Uh, meanwhile, over in the Americas, uh, you had Mayans playing Pocketok. Have you ever heard of that before? I have not. It is really fascinating. Um, it's kind of like a mixture of basketball and soccer, but you could only use your thighs to pass the ball um, and to shoot it through a stone hoop. Um, years ago, when I was about 18, I went on a trip to Mexico on a cruise, and one of our excursions was going to this uh, like stadium they had recreated from Mayan culture, and we actually watched these people with Mayan ancestry play Paca Talk, and it was pretty awesome, honestly. Uh, I wish I had a video of that still to show, but... Uh, you know, this was before we all had video capabilities on phones. I didn't even have a cell phone back then. Um, my favorite part, I remember they actually lit the ball on fire at one point, and they were, like, passing it back and forth to each other. Uh, it was pretty wild. Um, I would like to see that happen in basketball at some point. Um, or maybe okay, I well, wouldn't. <laughs> a ball on fire sounds terrifying, but as you're explaining Pocket Talk... My first thought was that I want to try this. This sounds fun. I, I have no interest in trying it. So you can try that. Let me know how it goes. Okay. Okay. Will um, do. Yeah. So meanwhile, uh, while the Mayans are yeah passing a ball back and forth to each other on fire, uh, in Europe, you had the first Olympic Games happening uh, around 776 BC. Um, now we'll talk about that more in our first uh, real episode, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But for the beginning of the ancient Olympic Games, they only had one race in the very beginning, the stadion, uh, which if that word sounds familiar, it's because it's the, the root word of stadium. Go figure. Um, of course, in the Olympic Games, again, we will talk about this in our full episode on it, but they later added things like chariot racing, wrestling, jumping, discus, javelin, um, early versions of boxing. So it, it's kind of like once people figured out how they wanted to compete against each other, we just kept finding new ways to do that. Um, and, and we still are. I mean, think about how many new games are invented all the time, um, not just sports, but even card games and things like that. Um, and then during the Roman period, of course, you had uh, gladiator events, uh, the bread and circuses throughout the Roman Empire, and uh, even the New Testament of the Bible mentions boxing and running. So, you know, there's documented proof that this idea really uh, caught on across the world of what sports should look like. But... As I kind of teed up in the intro, sports as we think about it and as we would recognize it today really became more popular in the 19th century, um, probably because of the impact of the Industrial Revolution. People weren't just going out into the fields to work all day. They, uh, society was changing, and so I think there was this idea of if you had a job where you were something like uh, a banker and you were sitting in an office all day, you wanted to do something that would keep you physically fit as well. And so we see physical activity and sports not just be something necessary because you had to be a hunter uh, and you had to be fast and things like that to survive. Uh, it became something that could be viewed recreationally as well. Um, and then, of course, also at the end of the 19th century, the world was really starting to become globalized. Uh, Japan opened up to the West in 1853, so there was this sharing of ideas and culture that just wasn't really possible until countries started trading with each other a lot more. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of overview. But let's go ahead and shift our focus uh, to sports that are actually in the Olympics, since that is the theme of the podcast. And we'll kind of talk about where some of those things come from. Uh, so, Sarah, since bowling is not an Olympic sport, at least not yet, 
Um, what do you think is the oldest Olympic event? Well, <clears throat> I feel like I can't say running since I already said running. <laughs> so based on the information that you have provided, could it possibly be wrestling? Um, it, you know, it is kind of a trick question because as I already mentioned, like running was the very first event at the original Olympics. But, you know, in terms of what we see today and in the Olympics, uh, based on what I researched, uh, skiing goes back a really long mm. way, uh, which really surprised me. That was not the one I was <laughs> expecting. Um, have you ever gone skiing? I have not, actually. Neither have I. Oh, good. Are Usually the... that makes me an oddball. Yeah. Are we the only two humans who have not done that? Because, <laughs> yeah, that that's one of the few things I can say in a game of I never. Um, mm -hmm. Because, Same. yeah, never, uh, <laughs> never gone skiing. My father-in-law really wants to take uh, our family to do that sometime in the next couple of years. So, so maybe that's going to change. But... Um, but yeah, skiing in America is really only about a hundred years old. Uh, but researchers did find a rock carving of a skier found on the Norwegian island of Rodoy, uh, which dates back more than 4,000 years, which just kind of boggled my mind. Um, you know, I have to wonder, like, how did someone come up with this? <laughs> <laughs> what what process was going through their mind to to say, yeah, let me strap something onto my feet and go down this mountain at a high speed? What do you think? <laughs> so my impulse thought is, was this an accidental discovery? Like, what if, I don't know, I just picture that maybe somebody stepped on a piece of wood or something, went down a hill, and then thought, wait a minute, that was kind of cool. Uh, what happens if I do this on purpose? Um, I don't know. I, maybe that's too far-fetched and just me living in my fantasy world. But um, yeah, that's really hard to imagine because now we kind of, you know, it's common sense for us to know safety things. And even though we've never been skiing, I know enough to know that there's, you know, equipment that is designed to go on your feet. We have helmets, we have all these things. And so 4,000 years ago, I mean, how... I. I would love to see what these skis looked like. I mean, maybe they did have helmets. They were Vikings, after all. So that's you true. know, that's they, true. yeah. So th they may have had they may have had some armor on uh, as they went down the mountain. But yeah, I can't help but think that these guys, you know, um, or or ladies, we have no idea who invented it. Uh, were you know went up a mountain and then they just maybe didn't have a real good plan for getting back down. You know, who knows? Maybe a storm hit and they were like well, crap, we got to get down the mountain real fast. And, you know, maybe they found some wood and decided to kind of turn it into a sled for their feet or something like that. No idea. But it's been around for a long time in the Norwegian area. So, uh, in fact, apparently it was so revered in Scandinavia that uh, the Vikings, uh, they worshipped uh, Ol and Skad. I think that's how you say that. Uh, the god and goddess of skiing. So, uh yeah, I, I guess maybe it was even a, a form of worship of some kind, possibly. Who knows? Um, now, yeah, one thing, sorry, one thing I will say about that, though, is that this does kind of bring home, um, for me, why we see so many Norwegians winning gold at the Winter Olympics, especially in cross-country skiing, that, I mean, I knew, I knew that there was a connection there, but I didn't realize it was 4,000 years old. So, um, it is truly ingrained in their culture. And I think that's really interesting. So, and also thinking about downhill skiing, so alpine skiing, but, um, but this also can include cross country skiing where they, I mean, just hopped on skis and went from one town to the next. So now that we're thinking about this, um, I'm envisioning a lot more than just hills. Yeah, I mean, they've got a, you know, 4,000 year head start on <laughs> the rest of the world in being really, really good at it, um, which kind of gets us to, you know, how did it get introduced in the U.S.? Uh, from, from what I found, apparently it was introduced here in America by Norwegian gold miners, because um, why not? 
if you're gonna be digging around for gold, you need a you need a break from that occasionally. So I could see them just going out on the on the hills to ski, and then everyone else watching them being like, "What in the world are you doing? And how can we do it with you?" Um, and then yeah, uh, alpine skiing, which you just mentioned, uh, got introduced in the 1936 Winter Games, and it's been a part of the Olympic program ever since then. I mean, it probably is. I don't have stats on this, but I would imagine it probably is one of the most popular events that people really look forward to. Um, what do you think? I I would agree with that. I feel like it's one of the signature winter sports. And here in the United States, we've had some really notable names um, competing for the United States. So at least here, what we see um, like on television and in the pregame's excitement, I, I feel like that's become very popular. Yeah. I mean, I'm always impressed by it, uh, personally, even though I've never done it myself. And actually, that's probably why I'm impressed by it, because I just am like, how in the world do you do that uh, at that speed? Oh, it speed? seems terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. So, skiing gets to claim that as far as uh, all the Olympic and Paralympic sports are uh, concerned, that it is the oldest tradition. Uh, boxing... Is the next one. So you mentioned that uh, earlier, like maybe wrestling or some sort of, uh, yeah, physical contest. Uh, yeah, it it apparently goes back at least three thousand years to Egypt. I'm sure people have been punching each other out long before that, but at some point, someone decided that uh, they should do it for fun and not just for war. So um, it was added to the ancient Olympic Games in the 7th century BC. And in my research, I found out that apparently, and, and you know, we'll talk about boxing a little bit more when we get into the Olympic Games, but apparently they would actually wrap these uh, leather straps around their arms for protection. But they also found out that that made them hit harder <laughs> as well. And then when the Romans came along, they were like, oh, this is a really cool sport. We like the idea of two guys just completely pulverizing each other. But no, 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 let's take away these leather straps and let's replace them with metal studded gloves. Um, <laughs> which just sounds brutal and terrifying. Um, what but... could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong using metal studded gloves on each other? Um, especially when you consider that, I mean, at least boxers today wear some form of clothing, but they're not wearing a ton when, when they're <laughs> battling it out. So you think of the ancient Olympics where they weren't wearing anything. Um, I, I can only imagine what that looked like. Um, now, boxing did kind of go on the decline after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, but it had a comeback in the 1600s, and that's when, in England, they started to officially organize some uh, amateur boxing clubs uh, around 1880. So again, people were, you know, boxing for fun, uh, or, you know, sparring, or whatever you want to call it, uh, but it was around 1880 that they actually said, okay, let's come up with some rules. Uh, let's, let's come up with some weight classes. Uh, Cause I'm sure they probably had situations where a really huge person was going against a tiny person. And they were like, Oh uh, yeah, that's probably not the most fair. We should start to split this up. Um, and then it made its Olympic debut at the 1904 St. Louis games. The U.S. was the only country that entered the event, so that's maybe a, a little bit awkward, um, and we'll talk podium about that sweep. a lot. Podium sweep. What's that? We got the podium sweep. <laughs> yeah, the U.S. got a lot of podium <laughs> sweeps in the 1904 games because we basically made up 90% of the athletes who were competing. Uh, that games was a mess, and I can't wait to talk about it more because it was such a mess. Um, but it's been in every Olympic Games since 1904, except for the 1912 Stockholm Games because boxing was illegal in Sweden at the time. And then the next sport that appears to be the next oldest, at least from what I looked up, is rowing. 
Um, it's technically been around as long as people have needed to travel across water and been jumping into boats. But uh, the first reference I found to it being a documented sport, uh, again, we're going to talk about Egypt, uh, it goes all the way back to the 15th century uh, BC of there being rowing competitions. Um, so starting in 1454, we're fast forwarding quite a bit, uh, London's early water taxi drivers actually started competing uh, both for money and apparently for bragging rights. Um, do you know anything about these water taxis? Have you ever heard of them? I've heard of them, um, but I don't know a ton about them, especially for the 1400s. But I am thinking, are these some of the earliest professional athletes? So, yeah, I mean, it kind of depends on what you consider an athlete, right? Um, you know, the old amateur codes uh, that the English created were actually pretty classist, and they were trying to keep people who were more physically fit because of their jobs out of uh, sports competitions. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you could say that these are some of the earliest professional <laughs> athletes because they were making their living off of rowing people uh, back and forth across waterways. Um, so have you ever seen the movie uh, Shakespeare in Love from the late 90s? Yes. Okay. So you might remember there's a scene in that movie where they're in a boat together and they're having a conversation and they pay a guy to take them across mm -hmm. the Thames or whatever. So, yeah, so that mm -hmm. was a water taxi being depicted in the movie. Uh, but, yeah, apparently they would the bragging rights came from them being able to say, oh, well, last year during our water taxi competitions, I was faster than that guy over there. So if you're wanting to get across the river really fast, I'm the guy you need to hire. And that's kind of how they would use these competitions to market themselves, essentially, which is pretty smart when you think about it. Um, and then uh, there has been a race uh, between London Bridge and Chelsea Harbor that has been held annually since 1715. So, um, if I ever get to London, which is on my, uh, bucket list, uh, I feel like I have to plan to go whenever they have this annual race. Cause that sounds amazing. <laughs> have you been yeah. to London? I have been to London for all of about 12 hours. So my experience <laughs> there is very limited. Saw just a couple of touristy sites, um, while I was there on a layover, but, um, I would love to see that race as well. Hey, at least you left the airport, because that's what counts. <laughs> if you've only yes. been to a city's airport, you haven't really been there. So, um, so that's yeah, at fair. least you got out and stepped onto, like, actual city ground. Well, um, and if this is not on brand for you, I don't know what is, but I was with a friend. We went to Westminster Abbey, but... That was, that was the place she wanted to go, and this was in 2013, so just a year mm -hmm. before, were the Summer Olympics in London. So mm -hmm. my spot to go to that was nearby is um, we went to the site of volleyball for the 2012 Olympic Games and got to see where Misty May and Carrie Walsh won gold. So Oh, nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then rowing as an Olympic sport became official in 1900. Um, so that would be the the second modern Olympic Games in Paris, uh, where they were literally rowing uh, in the Seine River there in Paris, which apparently um, was not the greatest idea in the world from the reading I've done on it so far. But, you know, you, you learn from your mistakes, right? Um, all right. So... Let's do this. We're going to take a quick little break now that we've got the oldest sports out of the way. And then we'll come back in a minute and uh, we'll start talking about things that you do with swords in your hand and riding on horses and all that good stuff. All right. Let's talk about fighting with swords because who doesn't like fighting with swords? Um, or at least in my house, it's a lot of lightsaber dueling. Uh, maybe not actual swords. Um, I I don't know. Are, are you a Star Wars fan at all? I am not, despite my best efforts. Mm. I'm sad to say I am not. It, it's okay. Um, 
yeah, it, it can't be everybody's thing, but my son and I, we love Star Wars, and we do have some pretty epic lightsaber battles at home. Uh, but that does not mean I should be trying to go into fencing. Um, now, <laughs> um, as far as actual sword play goes, uh, obviously that has also been around since prehistoric times. Um, you know, my thought is people going to war, like you've got to, you've got to practice <laughs> before you go fight the, the neighboring tribe or, you know, the invading horde or whatever it is coming your way. So I, I'm sure at, on a practical level, fencing started up just because warriors needed to practice, right? Am I, am mm -hmm. I off there? No, I, I would think so. Yeah. What you, I mean, you don't want to send someone with no experience to fight for your land. Yeah. I mean, that's my thought too. But I also wonder, like, how long did it take them to figure out that, um, you know, maybe they needed to use practice swords and maybe not the real deal? Like, uh, there's a part of me that's really curious about, <laughs> about how that side of it started up. But from what we know is there is an example of um, fencing or sword play in a relief on a temple wall uh, from 1190 BC uh, in Egypt, of course. There they are making another appearance. Um, and then, of course, in Rome, uh, it was a, they had a highly systemized form of combat that was used both for soldiers and for gladiators uh, to be able to learn. I mean, you know, you watch, like, the movie Gladiator, and it looks pretty dang cool fighting with a sword. Um, but, yeah, I've never tried it myself. How about you? I have not. Fencing is a sport that I think would be fun to try, um, but I don't guess I've ever uh, tried to go find the opportunity, but <laughs> it's also, I think, in our area... Uh, we live in North Texas. Um, it's not a very popular sport because I guess we're, we're the football capital, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this is going to be my new project is as we're going through all these old sports, I need to find a way to try these things out. By all means, uh, tell me what you find <laughs> out because I, um, you know, my wife was recently asking me what I want for Christmas. Um, I, I'm notoriously difficult to get a present for for Christmas because I don't know. I just don't think about that sort of thing. Just like what I want on my list the way I did when I was a kid. Uh, and so I told her a while back ago, I was like, you know what you could get me? You could get me like buy me like an archery session or something like that. Like I've always wanted to try archery. So so why don't you like book a time for me? And she was like, yeah, I've looked into that. And basically, you just go whenever. So it's not something I need to really, like, book for you. I'll just tell you when to go. I was like, okay, done. See, Merry Christmas to me. Um, but yeah, you know, sword plays one of those things. And fencing, you know, it's one of those things I've always liked to watch. But same as you, I've never looked into, does anyone even do it in our area? Because <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know how, how popular uh, it really is. Um, but later on after the Roman era, um, it started to become associated with, uh, seedy criminal types. And that's literally the wording from my research. And I thought it was hilarious. Seedy criminal types. Uh, so it got so bad to the point that in 1286, King Edward I of England passed this, uh, edict where basically... It wasn't made illegal, but it was royally frowned upon uh, and discouraged among the population. Um, and Sarah, if you had to guess, uh, how did the English respond to this royal edict? Um, I'm thinking they were pretty rebellious. Yeah, I mean, they just kind of shrugged it off and ignored it. And, yeah. the you know sword play continued to flourish despite it. So, you know, the king made his position clear that it was discouraged, people shouldn't do it, and people just, you know, did it anyway. Uh, but uh, during the 15th century, uh, there started to be guilds formed for fencing masters, 
and that became prominent not just uh, in England, but also throughout all of Europe. And later on, King Henry VIII was actually one of the earliest supporters of fencing guilds. So the royal position kind of flopped the other way when he came along and he was like, yeah, I think this is pretty cool. Knock yourself out. Keep doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and that's we see the same thing happen today. In Italy, uh, they were really the ones who started to use the point of the blade rather than the edge in their competitions, uh, which is what we would kind of more see as fencing today. Uh, so they, they really were shifting the focus away from just uh, brute force with a blade to you know, finesse and speed and, you know, dexterity. And that style just flourished and spread. Um, did you get to watch fencing in the Tokyo games at all? I did. I did. Um, and also just saying, I did not realize that uh, Italy was so central to the development of fencing as we see it today. Yeah, like, no, that I, came as a surprise to me as well. Yeah. Like, welcome to the conversation, Italy. Um, <laughs> but yes, I did watch fencing in the Olympics. Yeah, I. it's one of those I always enjoy watching, too. But I, I'm always kind of staggered by just how fast they are. And I'll think one person gets the point and then the other mm -hmm. person gets it because they were just that fast. And they beat them by, like, milliseconds to getting that point. Um, and, and I even heard a couple of interviews this year with different fencers, uh, on, you know, other podcasts and where they would talk about, you know, the importance of like anticipating, but like, yeah, you have these, you know, milliseconds to decide what you're going to do, because if you don't do it first, then you're losing that point. Um, and so, yeah, it just was stunning to me to hear kind of how, how they even practice that and how they get so fast. Um. Uh, but it's been an Olympic event since 1896. Um, now, apparently, the rules have often been disputed early on in the Olympic Games. Um, so depending on which country was hosting, they might have different rules. And obviously, that would lead to disagreement. Because uh, in the first few modern Olympic Games, the judges were all from the host country. And we'll talk about that more um, when we get there. But you can imagine how there might maybe have been a little bit of bias involved when the judges, you know, had to give a point to someone. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, but, I mean, you know, judges would never be biased, of course. Um, that would never, never. happen. Never. Never. Um, so, yeah. So early on, there would be disagreements because different countries would do things different ways. And then when you throw them in an international competition together, you've got some fencers who are following this set of rules and then you've got other fencers uh, following a different set of rules. So that kind of led to eventually there being an international federation for fencing uh, that was founded in 1913. And they standardized the rules so that there wouldn't be as much dispute um, at the Olympic Games because those were really back then the only international fencing competitions that there were. Everything else was done on the national level. So uh, so thankfully now there's not nearly as much disagreement in the system as there used to be. Um, and I'm sure as technology has improved and we know who, you know, touched first and things like that, I'm sure that's helped as well. So definitely. Yeah. And then um, I have to ask you, because I know you're a fan of puns. Um, are you ready to horse around a bit? Yay or nay? <laughs> <laughs> ah, what a dad joke. I'm here well, for I, it. <laughs> yeah, I'm a dad. What do you expect? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I guess let's gallop into the next category. Oh, my gosh. Yes, let's. <laughs> uh, so equestrianism, if you haven't guessed that already. Um, now, I, I like riding horses. I have not done it in a long time, but it's kind of, as you mentioned, we live in Texas. It's kind of a rite of passage, I feel like. You have to ride a horse at some point, whether you grew up in the country or the city. It doesn't matter. It's just something that you do at some point. Um, but as we think of it, equestrianism, the first sporting contest dates back to the chariot races that were added into the ancient Olympic Games in 582. And uh, at the 25th 
ancient um, Olympiad. Um, and that's 582 BC, I should say, not 582 AD. Um, so yeah, chariot racing was incredibly dangerous. Uh, um, people would get hurt. People would get killed. Um, oftentimes the owners of the horses would not actually be driving them themselves for that reason. They would send, you know, like a, a slave to do it <laughs> for them uh, because it was so dangerous. Um, and then during the medieval era, um, of course, we've got, you know, knights getting on horses for jousting competitions. Um, I'm trying to think of what other sports are there with horses involved? Can you think of any? Um, well, there's pentathlon. Okay. Uh, modern yep. modern pentathlon. Although I don't know if you've been following the news, but I have. I have. It, it seems like that one might no longer involve horses. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a touchy um, subject right now. Um, it is. So, but I mean, it's also technically, I guess, I'm no expert when it comes to the sport of equestrian, but I feel like that that was an equestrian aspect of it so i don't know if it would be considered like a different sport just because it's part of the sport you know what i mean yeah well and of course you know <clears throat> horse racing in general has been popular for you know a long time at some point mm -hmm. people decided hey let's get rid of this chariot thing and let's just jump onto a horse and see whose horse can go the fastest i mean that's incredibly popular still here in america um i mean you know, people go to their local horse racing venue and place their bets on their favorite horse and all that good stuff. And and, and really, uh, that's kind of, I think, what most people, maybe the form of equestrianism that most people are, you know, acquainted with. In 1868, that's really kind of when we mark uh, equestrianism's popularity spreading across Europe and America. Uh, the Royal Dublin Horse Show was one of the first um formalized, you know, race horsing <laughs> events that was put together. Um, and then by the 1912, or by 1912, uh, the Stockholm Games, uh, that's really when they decided to add things like show jumping, dressage, um, and eventing uh, for the sports medal uh, lineup. At least that's what I found in, in my research. Um, I have to admit, it's not highest on my list in terms of what I watch when the games come around. Uh, but if I can catch it, I'm still always impressed by what they're able to do. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because there are so many Royals that, or I guess I should, I should call them members of the Royal family. Um, and, and not just, um, not just from Great Britain, but, um, I feel like there's been <clears throat> members of royal families from around Europe that have participated in equestrian. And so, you know, it's just, it's definitely not a sport that you can just go to school and pick up or, um, you know, it, yeah. you've, it, it's a very expensive sport. So, um, it feels like it's hard to always know the details of what's going on, unless it's a sport that you've had time to be around, really understand, um, cause in full disclosure, I usually think, well, that was a pretty jump. And then <laughs> like <laughs> they didn't, they didn't knock the bar down. So it's great. And then, you know, find out that there's a lot more of a technical side to it. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it's really interesting that so many Royal family members have participated in this sport at the Olympic level. Yeah. It's not the most accessible sport, um, for mm -hmm. sure. And so you do see it being, uh, kind of a, a wealthy person's sport, more or less, because, yeah, it's not just about the event itself. It's taking care of the horse. It's the breeding. It's the stables. It's all of those things that go into um, having a horse that you can use for competition purposes. And, and maybe one of these days, uh, you know, that might be a good bonus episode is just talking about equestrianism, because I've always wondered, like, how do the horses travel to the games? Um, and I think that Ooh, would be something worth looking really into. That's actually really fun. Yeah, uh, that's actually it's a really fascinating um, thing to learn about. So, yeah, yeah. Side note is that Flame Alive did a great interview with someone who's in charge of that. So, if you actually are interested in that, I definitely recommend listening to that interview. Okay, I must have missed that one. Um, it was one of it was one of their very very early episodes. Okay. 
I'll have, yeah, I'll have to go take a look because, yeah, I've always wondered that, but I've never spent the time researching how that happens. And I think it's fascinating. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, in a sense, the, the lack of accessibility has always kind of been a tradition because even in the ancient games, like, you didn't have just anyone doing chariot racing. It was, <laughs> even back then, it was wealthy people who were entering that event, whereas, you know, the foot racing and wrestling and things like that, like, you know, pretty much anyone from any background could enter those um, and and even, you know, become a winner and change their life by <laughs> winning one of those other sports. Uh, whereas in the ancient Olympic Games, the charioting, um, it, it was the owner of the horses who was considered the winner, not the person driving the chariot, uh, not the horses like we, you know, see here in the States with horse racing where the horse is considered uh, you know, the champion and, and we kind of clap the jockey on the, on the back, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, it, it's always, I guess, kind of had a, an elite side to it. Um, and I don't know that there's a way around that yet, but who knows, maybe in the future, it will be a more accessible sport for people. So, um, but now we've got to get into, one of my favorites, uh, which is gymnastics. Um, yeah, it's my, one of my, my favorites too. Yeah. And I think it is for a lot of people. Uh, but, uh, I've always admired, uh, gymnasts and just what they're able to do. It just, it's mind boggling. They're literal super humans. Um, and you know, we put my son in gymnastics, you know, years ago when he was two years old, um, uh, really at that time to help him with some coordination issues. And then he just like took off and now he competes. So, I mean, it's, it's become a part of our, our lives. Uh, but its roots do go back to ancient Greece, uh, where it was developed as a form of exercise uh, for both men and women, which was something I, I didn't know until I started looking into this a bit more. Um, of course, the translation of the word gymnasium uh, comes from an original Greek uh, phrase, which means to exercise naked. Um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time focusing on that, but that is where it comes from. Uh, but the idea to kind of, uh, you know, get to that word naked and the connotations it has, you know, it can also mean the basics of something. And that's really what gymnastics is at its core, is that there are just basic skills that can translate into any type of sport out there in terms of flexibility and strength and all those sort of aspects. So uh, that's even something at my son's gym that we had to have this whole meeting when they were asking him to join their preteen program. They talked about, look, even if your child doesn't stick with this sport, uh, he is going to be learning all of these skills that will translate into any other sport he might want to pursue in the future, which was an incredibly valid point. Uh, but the early gymnastics program that was practiced in Greece uh, for exercise purposes uh, included things like running, jumping, swimming, throwing, wrestling, and weightlifting. Um, also, rope climbing was considered a gymnastics um, discipline. So there's several things in there that we would not think of as gymnastics today. Um, the most surprising in that list to me is, is swimming. Uh, which of those did, do you think is the strangest in that lineup? I would have to say swimming also. <laughs> yeah. Because that is the farthest thing from gymnastics that I think about. <clears throat> um, I mean, rope climbing, we know that a lot of gymnasts, even now, they use that as part of their conditioning and their training. And I'm sure your son does rope climbing. Um, oh, yeah. But, but yeah, something that kind of piggyback on going back for a second when you were talking about how it, the coaches at his gym said, even if he doesn't stick with the sport, this is something that translates. I mean, that was my experience that I, when I was little, I did gymnastics and I did kind of a recreational team program, never was going to be a superstar or anything. But um, whenever I ended up playing volleyball, the skills that I learned in gymnastics, I played back row. So I was not afraid mm. to roll and I could get back up on my feet quickly because I had learned that in gymnastics. Um, so it was wild that a sport that I had quit maybe eight years before I was in high school, that it served me well, even as a teenager. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, you know, I thought swimming was an odd fit in there, too. But then I started thinking about it because early on in the Olympic Games, diving was considered a part of the swimming discipline uh, because of the pool, obviously. And, you know, even this year during the Games, you would hear so many divers who in their background had done gymnastics. And if you look into what they do with diving, there are a lot of similarities with how they use the muscle groups um, with uh, gymnasts, especially when you think of some of the twisting motions that they do off of the diving board. So at first it seems like an odd fit for being considered part of gymnastics, but there there are overlaps that uh, exist when you look into it a little bit deeper. So That does make sense. Yeah, and, and you're right about the rope climbing. Uh, gymnasts still do that as part of their conditioning. My son does it every single week. Uh, in the early modern Olympic Games, they did give out um, <laughs> prizes for rope climbing. It was one of the events early on, and I told my son that recently. I, I said, hey, did you know they used to have an event for rope climbing in the Olympics? And he was like, huh. I would win the gold. Like he was just so <laughs> confident in it. And, and I mean, he is a good rope climber. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, but so, so gymnastics used to really kind of be this overarching term for really almost any kind of uh, exercise that was practiced, but it started to become more formalized and narrowed down uh, after the Romans conquered Greece and they were using gymnastics uh, routines to actually prepare their troops for battle. Um, and, and and yeah, you think about, I mean, the might of Rome and how they were able to uh, conquer uh, the known world at that time. It, you think about teaching a soldier some of these moves in gymnastics, it, it kind of makes sense why maybe they were able to uh, surprise opposing armies. Um, you know, tumbling also became a really popular form of entertainment across the Roman Empire. Um, and then as the Roman Empire declined, so did uh, its popularity. Uh, but just like a lot of the other things we've talked about here, it made a comeback. <laughs> so in the late 1700s, um, there was a there was a prominent German educational reformer by the name of uh, Johann Bernhard uh, Beistow. I uh, hope I pronounced that correctly because I'm not great with uh, German names, but uh, he was really the one who added physical exercise to courses for schools and really advocated for this idea of uh, you need to be, you know, mentally healthy, but also physically uh, healthy. And so um, there was also another German, uh, Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, uh, and he is known as the father of modern gymnastics. Uh, so he introduced things like the sidebar, the horizontal bar, the parallel bars. Uh, apparently he had a thing for bars. Um, may, I, I just hope he didn't have a drinking problem. Um, the <laughs> balance beam, uh, jumping events, uh, basically the, the basis of the vault. So he's really the one who kind of came up with, if we were to sit in on one of his training sessions, we would be able to recognize it as gymnastics that we see today. Um, and yeah, he just apparently came up with uh, a lot of those bar events, got really into it. Um, by the early 1800s, gymnastics clubs were opening up in continental Europe and in Great Britain. Uh, weightlifting and wrestling were dropped as gymnastics events um, at that point uh, and kind of took on their own, you know, life, right? Separate from that. Um, but there was still a, a real focus in the gymnastics community on the excellence uh, with their form. Um, and that's something that, you know, my son's coach talks about with them all the time is their form and uh, how clean things need to be. Like, you don't need to just be able to do the moves, but you need to do them with good form because that's where you're going to lose points um, if you're not focusing on that. Um, and then if you had to guess, uh, how did it make its breakthrough in America? What do you think the kind of inciting incident was for that? Well, if I had to guess, uh, and this is assuming that I have no idea what you're about to say, but <laughs> if I if I had to guess, um, I would assume that hmm, 
maybe there were immigrants that came over and introduced it as a new, you know, it, with this idea of physical education, because we see that, you know, Germany and it was part of education. I would assume mm -hmm. that someone came over and brought those ideas as so many things happen in the United States. The ideas that we um, sometimes make our own or that we excel at usually come from somewhere else. So that would be my assumption. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would have uh, thought the same thing, and and maybe it did. Um, this was one thing that was honestly a little a little bit vague in the research <laughs> that I was diving into. Is that yeah, surely it came over with immigration because uh, there is a big German influence in different parts of the U.S. Uh, but as far as its popularity, what I was able to find is that there was um, there was a guy named Doctor Dudley Allen Sargent. Uh, who was a Civil War era physical education educator. And that's a weird phrase, uh, but that's literally how I have it in my notes. Uh, but he's often credited with helping introduce gymnastics um, in the U.S. So, you know, maybe someone else taught him first and then he took credit for it. Um, you know, that's never happened in history, someone taking credit for someone else's work. <laughs> but... Um, you know, maybe that's how it happened, but uh, what we can definitely give him credit for is he created more than 30 pieces of gymnastics apparatus. Uh, so he his interest in the sport was to the point that he basically built a business out of it and started making uh, all these different types of apparatus for people to be able to use for physical education. Um, so when and that's you say... Really... Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. So when you say 30 pieces of apparatus, are we talking like different styles of bars or mats or different beams? Do you have any idea kind of what that looked like? Yeah, so he was kind of tweaking uh, different types of bars, um, you know, even uh, like rings, uh, things of that nature, just kind of playing around with different designs. And then as people would ask about them, he'd be like, oh, this is how you use this one. And this one helps you with this. And this one helps you with that. Because um, I'll, I'll tell you, again, just from watching my son compete and watching him train, that there's a lot of different apparatuses that they use when they're training that you would never necessarily see in a competition. Um, you know, there's special ones that they have just for learning and training and things like that. So uh, apparently that's what he was into, was just finding different uh, styles of apparatus um, and then selling them to people, essentially. <laughs> so uh, that's that's what I got out of the research anyway. Um so uh, if someone else has a different idea or knows more about that or is a distant relative of Dr. Sargent, uh, by all means, I'm open to learning more about what kind of things he created. But yeah, he um, sounds like a fascinating guy. Yeah, no, he definitely sounds interesting. Sounds uh, like a creative inventor type. So, uh, I mean, that's not how I want to spend my day, but good on him. <laughs> Um, now, men's gymnastics debuted at the OG Olympic Games in uh, 1896, the first modern Olympics, and it's been included in every single uh, summer Olympiad since 1924. So in those early years, it wasn't in every single one, but since 1924, it's always been a part of it. Uh, there have been changes to the program over time in terms of what events have been done. Uh, the all-around event uh, for the women's competition was added in the 36 Berlin Games. Um, and early on in the modern Olympics, uh, gymnasts from Germany and Sweden, Italy, uh, Switzerland also, they really dominated the event in the early days of the sport. Um, and then the dominance shifted over to Japan in the 50s. Um, and then the Soviet Union and other Eastern European nations started to dominate after that. Um, and then, you know, now it's kind of uh, shifted back some other directions. Uh, you know, the Japanese men's team tends to be incredible and tends to feature some of the best uh, gymnasts in the world. Uh, but, you know, it's the the love has been spread around more than than what it used to be, where you had one certain nation dominating it in the past. Um, all right. Now, uh, for kind of like our, well, 
not our final topic for this part of it, but I think one that's really interesting because it's one of the most popular sports in the world and one of the most accessible sports of this conversation wouldn't be complete without talking about football and not American football, but what we call soccer. Uh, and then of course, rugby. Um, so if you had to guess, which one of those two do you think came first? My guess would be football or soccer. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you were paying attention at the beginning of this episode, um, absolutely. It would be football. Um, so we mentioned before that about, uh, you know, 2000 years ago in ancient China, there was a game called Suchu, uh, where players would kick around an animal hide ball. Um, now how formalized it was and how they scored, uh, didn't find a lot of research on that, but the evidence that it was played was there. And then of course, different versions of football, um, have been, uh, played in different regions of Europe. Um, it really came to the forefront of sports though, as we know it around the mid 1800s. Um, and of course in England, um, and it's really the English who codified the rules of the sport. So that makes sense when you consider how popular football is in the UK uh, and surrounding area. Um, but one of the ways they codified it early on was they decided that they needed to make uh, tripping other players and touching the ball um, with the hands illegal. So uh, apparently there was a time when you could do those two things and not be breaking the rules. Um, it's I, so I hard to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, you would think like the first game someone tried that, that someone would pipe up and say, hey, that shouldn't be allowed. But, you know, apparently it took a while for them to say that should be against the rules. Um, football has been in every modern Olympiad except for 1896 Athens and in 1932. Uh, and the reason I found was because in 1932, uh, FIFA had just been formed uh, pretty recently, and they wanted to promote uh, the second World Cup tournament of 1934 instead of throwing their weight behind the Olympics in 32. So they kind of, um, in FIFA character, you know, thought about themselves yeah. first, you know. Yeah, I and, was going to uh, say, sounds, sounds like <laughs> FIFA. It, it, it's pretty consistent uh, with them. <laughs> Uh, but you know, th they decided to kind of advertise their own thing instead, but, uh, but they did, you know, return to the Olympic games. It was just that, you know, 1932 games that they kind of backed out of. Um, and then, uh, amazingly women's football was not added until 1996 Atlanta. Yeah, that was a big deal. That boggled my mind. I didn't realize it was that late that... <laughs> women's soccer became a thing at the Olympics. Um, yeah, I, I remember it being very pivotal, um, you know, as a millennial uh, and a girl that was growing up um, where the 1996 Olympics were, you know, a huge deal, um, especially being in Atlanta in the United States. But mm -hmm. I remember, I remember soccer being a big deal for, for the girls and um, growing up and a lot of those athletes were our idols. Um, and, you know, like I said earlier, I played soccer for, you know, like two seasons on a rec league, but it was enough mm -hmm. to get me interested in the sport. And when I look back, it, I'm with you, it blows my mind that it took so long for the women to catch up, but it's also kind of par for the course when it comes to sports inclusion. Yeah. Unfortunately, that yeah. is the case. Um, but yeah, I, I just didn't realize it was that late in history that it, you know, finally got added into the program. Um, and then, of course, uh, rugby, uh, which is kind of football's cousin. Um, but, you know, it didn't necessarily come directly out of football. Um, it can be traced back over 2000 years to a Roman game called Harpistum. Uh, which also comes from a Greek word because, you know, Greek words are the basis of half of the English language. Um, but it comes from a Greek word that means uh, like to seize or to take away, uh, which makes sense given the sport. 
So its modern debut uh, was in 1749 at a school that was built in rugby in Warwickshire, England. Um, I, it's obviously a complete coincidence that it's, it happens to be named as the school. Um, and it was designed to be exercise for young gentlemen, which is really funny to me when you think about a rugby game. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's not particularly gentlemanly. You know, you would think of like golf or even fencing as like a gentleman's type sport. But, uh, but yeah, apparently that's what they were designing it for. And then uh, originally it had very few rules and the ball was actually kicked uh, instead of being carried. Uh, the games could go on for five days, apparently. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure how that that worked. Uh, I mean, they had you know, to sleep and I, I guess maybe when the sun went down, they uh, Maybe. Stopped? I don't know. Uh, it, it's definitely worth exploring if someone out there knows like if they just like rotated people in and kept playing but yeah you would think they would stop for sunset and then just pick it up the next day uh but yeah they since they had very few rules uh i guess they just didn't know when to stop playing so games could go on for a really long time and then this part's hilarious to me in 1823 a player named william webb ellis was the first to decide to pick up the ball and run with it <laughs> which completely revolutionized the game. Um, and I'm just like, I would like to be there for that moment of him just picking it up and like running with it and scoring. And then everyone just kind of looking around being like, can, can you do that? Well, the, the rule book doesn't say anything against it. So yeah, I guess he can. Um, so that's really when people kind of mark the modern version of rugby, really separating itself from uh, football because of him deciding to pick it up. And then everyone was like, that's a brilliant idea. Why didn't we think of this 50 years ago? Um, I wonder how many, I wonder how many sports are like that where someone just decided to do something and everyone decided, all right, we'll go with it. And it completely changed the course of sports history for that particular sport. Um, yeah. I, I can't think of another example, maybe, and this will be for another time, like the Fosbury flop in uh track and field the high jump mm. where um it was fosbury yeah. that came up with the idea of jumping backwards which yeah. is what everybody does now um but yeah i can't we're, we're like basically the, it, i guess if it wasn't in the rules the rule book didn't change but i guess it became explicitly okay to pick up the ball and run with it that's that's wild yeah yeah it's just funny to me that's like he just thought, I'm just going to give this a try and see what happens. And everyone was okay with it. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, but, uh, you know, what I learned according to the official Olympics page about World Rugby, uh, rugby with 15 players per team uh, was featured in the Olympic Games in 1900, in 1908, in 1920, and in 1924. Uh, rugby sevens... Uh, was introduced at the Rio games in 2016. So, uh, you know, there's different versions that have been played at the Olympics. And then there's been a lot of Olympiads where they didn't play it at all. So, uh, but I'm glad it's around. I, I, I like catching it when I can. Um, mm -hmm. all right, we're going to take another quick little break. And, uh, then we're going to finish off with, uh, probably one of the most, in my opinion, kind of baffling parts of sports history uh, that really kind of helped lead the way to what we know as uh, sports fanaticism today. So we'll be back in just a second. All right. Now, if you had asked me before doing the research for this episode, um, I honestly would have thought that the most popular sport of the 1800s uh, leading up to the return of the Olympic Games, I would have thought it was football, just based on its popularity today, just based on how accessible it is. That would have been, you know, my pick. Do you feel any different? No, I'd say that would probably be my pick as well. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to make sense. So what I was really surprised about when I was 
digging into this topic of the history of sports was I found out that the most popular sport in the 1700s and the 1800s, at least here in America, was pedestrianism. Um, how much have you heard about pedestrianism as a sport? <laughs> well, um, I am familiar with the sport that pedestrianism is, except not by that name. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the grandfather of what we would call race walking, which is mm -hmm. the most awkward looking, you know, Olympic <laughs> sport. Um, I was just having a conversation with some coworkers about it the other day, and they were like, this is the dumbest looking thing in the world. And I was like, yeah, but they are moving at a pace of like six and a half minutes per mile. Like they are walking faster than most people can run. <laughs> Oh yeah. And oh yeah. It's people make fun of it. People, you know, when you're out walking and some people are like, Oh, I'm a race walker. And they start, you know, trying to move in a silly way. And then I think about the fact that even though I like to, I like to jog, I'll not use the word run. I like yeah. to jog for long distances. And even on my best day, I could not run as fast as these people are walking. It's mind blowing. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I was like at the height of my running ability in high school, you know, I could I could run in cross country. I could do a six minute mile, but even that not consistently. <laughs> so the fact that they can keep up the pace they can having to follow the rules of race walking for as long as they have to keep it up is actually pretty amazing. Uh, but yeah, it used to be a really, really popular sport in America. So uh, you know, back then, again, it was called pedestrianism, um, but it was an early long distance and endurance sport. Um, and one of the first notable cases, uh, at least here in America, uh, was this guy named Foster Powell, who in 17, uh, or actually, no, this was in England. I apologize, not in America. Um, but in 1773, he walked 400 miles from London to York and then back. Um, now, I, I don't know exactly what that route is like, having not been to that area, but all I need to know is 400 miles. <laughs> it's just it's a lot. baffling. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, obviously it's one of those sports that, um, you know, they, they would take breaks and things like that. Um, you know, they would eat, they would drink along the way they would maybe take short rests but but not very long uh so it was not just physical endurance it was mental endurance um you know being able to stay awake for long periods of time um and so in the uk sir john astley founded a, a long distance championship of the world in 1878 and it was staged over the course of six days um there was a incredibly wide interpretation of the rules. Again, they, they didn't want to set a ton of rules. It was more about the endurance and being able to last through the six days. So you could walk, you could trot, you could run. Um, I'm guessing you could skip if you want to. Um, I don't know. But as long as you kept moving, you could stay in the competition, essentially. Um, now, it became popular in America because Astley brought that version of pedestrianism over here uh, by organizing what he called the Great Six Days Race. Um, and I found this really amazing BBC article called The Strange 19th Century Sport That Was More Popular Than Football. Uh, it was written by uh, uh, Zariah Gorvet. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Zariah, if you ever listen to this. Um, let me know. Maybe it's Zaria. Uh, so I apologize if I butchered your name. I tried to find it and couldn't. Uh, but in 1879, a pedestrian event in New York City was described as 13 mostly mustachioed athletes in tight leggings and tiny shorts gathered under the towering arches of the original Madison Square Garden in New York, along with 10,000 raucous spectators. So not just spectators, but raucous spectators. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That is not so, what I would have expected for some of the early days of Madison Square Garden is everyone showing up 
and being raucous spectators to this event. Oh, yeah. They had beer. They had snacks. They had people trying to break in because they couldn't afford the $1 ticket price. Um, they even had corporate sponsors for the athletes, um, one of whom was supported by a still very popular salt brand um, that I won't mention because I don't have the rights to. Uh, but uh, the article went on to say that the rules were really simple. Uh, essentially, contestants were required to walk in circles for six days in a row until they had completed laps equivalent to at least 455 or sorry, 450 miles, that's 724 kilometers. Uh, they could run, amble, stagger, or crawl, uh, but they must not leave the oval-shaped sawdust track until the race was over. That line stood out to me, sawdust track. I just think about, like, walking across sawdust for six days. Mm -hmm. does not sound Every enjoyable to me. Everyone is probably, <laughs> like, I, I'm thinking of the smell of sawdust right now and it, yeah, yeah, it's not pleasant. Yeah. There had to be tons of like hay fever, you know, um, in there and yeah, it must've been insane. Um, the article also said instead they ate, drank and napped and presumably performed other bodily functions, uh, in little tents that were set up at the side, uh, some of which were elaborately furnished. Um, the winner, uh, was going to receive $25,000, which in today's money would be $679,000. So, um, yeah, there was good money involved in being one of these competitors. So, uh, oh, plus, plus, if the money wasn't good enough, the winner would also get a solid silver belt engraved with the boastable title of Long Distance Champion of the World. So, move over, Eliud Kipchoge. There's a new long, or rather an old long distance champion in town. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would show up to that event or not. Uh, I wonder <laughs> how, like, how did that work? Could you leave and, like, get a stamp on your hand and come back the next day? Like, I wonder how they monitored who had tickets and whatnot right but yeah that um, that is wild and it does make me wonder if they were to set something up similar today mm -hmm. i wonder would kipchoge how would he do because he seems superhuman to me um so since you brought him up he i'm is. just thinking he'd probably just be great he'd win and he'd do it with a smile on his face and make it look easy Oh, I know. Yeah, I, I laughed this year at the Tokyo Games because, you know, you had first, second, and third that the camera was staying on. And, you know, it's like second and third, when they crossed, they both looked like they had run a marathon. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they both looked exhausted. They looked tired. <laughs> Eliud Kipchoge, when he crossed the finish line, he literally smiled and posed for the cameras. Like, he could go, like, just run another, you know, 26.2 miles right away. Um, he is superhuman. Yeah. Um, but uh, as you can imagine, um, betting became a big part of the sport of pedestrianism. Um, just like, you know, betting in track and field uh, was really popular back then as well. And in its own kind of way, uh, gambling actually did help inspire the Olympic movement because people wanted to purify sports. Um, they wanted to kind of take away the seedier aspects of it that had been normalized um, and really make it about the sport, not um, about money. Um, obviously, that's still a struggle we're having today in sports. Um, but, you know, best intentions of trying to purify it. Um, and then at the 1904 St. Louis Games, uh, the decathlon that Olympiad actually included an 800 meter walk. So um, in its own way, pedestrianism, you know, kind of continued as part of the Olympic Games. But the first standalone appearance of race walking actually happened at the 1906 Intercalated Games. Do you know about the Intercalated Games? I don't. I would love for you to tell me about them. 
Oh, we're going to do an episode on them. Because um, they saved the Olympic Games, even though they're not considered uh, anymore as official Olympics. But we'll do an episode on it. Um, they're worth I've talking about. It. Um, so that's when race walking first showed up in 1906. And then, of course, in 1908, the London Games. Uh, women's events were not added, of course, until 1992. So I, there again, it is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> It just kind of baffles, you know, just, yeah, boggles my mind why it takes so long for it to be okay for women to do a sport that's not inherently, quote unquote, masculine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it, there were, it's walking. There were always excuses. And I mean, this is another story for another time. And sure. we will get into another episode, I'm sure, as we go through the history of the games. But um yeah, I know the most common thing is that they were always like, well, we're worried that it's going to ruin women's um, ability to have children. Like, that was a popular thing, that sports would be damaging to women's bodies. Which which is funny because, uh, you know, a lot of times doctors will recommend for women who are going into labor, at least that's what I've heard, like, hey, you need to walk around. You need to, like, move. And, yeah, yeah. it's insane. It was, it was the IOC making those decisions, not doctors. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. Of course. Of course. Uh, but um, race walking, you know, you wouldn't think this about it, but kind of a final note as we close out this uh, episode is uh, it has been plagued with problems of performance enhancing drugs, um, which it's not the sport I think you would pick out for that. Like weightlifting. Sure. Um, you know, running. Sure. Like those are sports that people tend to have their eyes on as like, oh, yeah, you know, people are going to dope with those uh, because you're talking about milliseconds and, you know, little microscopic differences between the winners. Uh, but, yeah, race walking has had quite a few problems with it where later on results had to be changed because it turned out someone had been doping. Uh, but uh, but there it is. So out of curiosity, do you know what kind of performance enhancing drugs? Because my guess would be, I mean, yeah, there's definitely things that, you know, can help you with muscles and steroids and all that. But it also makes me wonder with a sport like that, could it be that people were taking the um, drugs? Because I think it's like with curling, Russian mm -hmm. curlers have been busted because they were taking drugs that help them focus more. Um, so not one that's going to help them necessarily perform better physically, but perform better mentally. Yeah. Um, no, in this case, it, it's purely based on, you know, whatever would give the athlete better endurance because it is an endurance sport. So, True. Um, True. so, you know, you can think of like the, you know, the Lance Armstrong scandal would be, uh, would be a good example of the types of drugs that would be also used in race walking. Uh, because long distance biking is primarily an endurance sport as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I don't have the list of the drugs here to recommend to people. Um, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, they would be anything that would boost your, you know, um, ability to go for long distances or to not feel pain. Uh, that's pretty common, uh, in terms mm -hmm. of doping. If you don't feel your legs giving out, then you just kind of keep going. So uh, but, uh, yeah, it'd be worth maybe diving into a little bit deeper if we ever talked specifically about that sport. But for now, um, that's where we're going to kind of wrap things up for this half. So, um, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and give us kind of a preview of what we're going to talk about in part two of the sequel to the history of sports. <clears throat> Yeah, in part two, we're going to talk more about the roots of some other Olympic sports that we haven't talked about yet, such as tennis, mm -hmm. swimming, and volleyball, one of my favorites. But I think it's safe to say that sports has pretty much always been part of the human experience, and dare I say it, even an essential part of our survival. If you enjoyed this episode, and we really hope you did, we hope you'll come back for part two of the history of sports. You can also find us online at gamesodyssey.com, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter for more Games Odyssey content. That's the word games and odyssey, O-D-Y-S-S-E-Y.com. You can also find us on our Facebook page, the Games Odyssey podcast, or Instagram at Games Odyssey pod, or on Twitter, you guessed it, at Games Odyssey pod. 
And of course, you can also help the show grow by sharing us with any of your friends, family, or enemies who also love the Olympics and Paralympics. And until then, I uh, hope you keep showing your Olympic and Paralympic spirit. The Games Odyssey Podcast is a production of Wardrobe Media, LLC. This episode was written, hosted, produced, and edited by Jonathan Jordan and co-hosted by Sarah Patton. Show notes, including research sources and transcripts, can be found on our website, gamesodyssey.com. Olympic is a trademark of the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, USOPC. Any use of Olympic in the Games Odyssey podcast is strictly for informational, commentary, and educational purposes. The Games Odyssey podcast is not an official podcast of the USOPC and is not sponsored, endorsed, or officially affiliated with the USOPC or the International Olympic Committee or International Paralympic Committee. The content of Games Odyssey podcast does not reflect the opinions, standards, views, or policies of the USOPC, and the USOPC in no way warrants that content featured in the Games Odyssey podcast is accurate.